I don't know he's a program, but I know he got something good for us. So that matter before Saeed is going to make a recitation for it, inshallah. So I'll make sure you do good on the matters and everything. A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Al yawma nahkimu ala afwahim wa tukallimuna aydihim wa tashadu arjuruhum bima kanu yaksibun wallo nashau datamasna ala ayunihim fasdabbaku sirata fa anna yubsirun wallo nashau namasna ala كانت فما استطاعوا مديا ولا يرجبون ومن نعامله ننقصه في القلق أفلا يخلون وما علمناه شعرا وما ينبغي له إن هو إلا ذكر وقرآن مبين لينذر من كان هيا ويحقق القول على الكافرين أولم يرى أن خلقنا لهم مما أملت أيدنا أن آمن فهم لها مالكون وذللناها لهم فمنها رقوبهم ومنها يأكلون ولهم فيها منافع ومشارب أفلا يشكرون وتكادوا من دون الله آلهة لألهم ينصرون لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جند مقدرون فلا يهزنك قالهم إنا نعلم ما يسرون وما يؤلنون أولم يرى الإنسان أنا قلقناه من نطفة فإذا هو قسم مبين سرق الله العظيم Thank you so much, Saeed. So, you see, Saeed, he learned from here. He's one of my students. We start from one to Z. So, this is a lot of effort. Saeed take a lesson from me every morning. After Fajr prayer, it's like uh, three or four years. So he complete the Quran. All of you hear how he recite the Quran. Alhamdulillah. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to help him through. Inshallah. Now we can listen to the Sheikh. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا First, we begin by acknowledging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the one whose mercy is felt by all in this life and whose mercy is felt in a special way for those who believe in the life to come. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we pray that his blessings and peace be upon the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and his family and his followers. And in light of the recitation of Surah Yasin, I actually what came to my mind was another ayah. It says, which is in a way central to the subject. It says, praise belongs to Allah, who has sent forth to his servant, meaning to the Prophet, Peace and blessings of God be upon him. Praise belongs to Allah who has sent upon his servant this scripture and has not allowed any corruption to be, to be placed therein. And again, this may be uh, central to our theme tonight. As we know, we are in the last few days of Ramadan and it is in these last few days, or excuse me, these last few nights of Ramadan, that we look for a particular experience. And in our tradition, we look for a, this particular experience in what's emphasized is the last, not only the last 10 nights of Ramadan, but the, la, the odd nights, the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, the 29th, although most people tend to emphasize on the 27th, which is perhaps why the Masjid is so crowded tonight, as is all the Masjid around the world. And this experience that we tend to look for, this experience is known as, or called Laylatul Qadr. It is called Laylatul Qadr, the night of measure, or the night of decree. Now, Rasulullah himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he experienced Laylatul Qadr. The first words of revelation to him was his first experience with what is called Laylatul Qadr. And the Quran, the scripture that our brother was reading earlier, this scripture is what was given to the Prophet at, the, at his experience of Laylatul Qadr. And it is also called, the experience was also called Laylatul Mubarakah, the blessed light, Laylatul Mubarakah. So about Laylatul Qadr, there are two aspects of Laylatul Qadr. The one aspect I think is well known and the second aspect is perhaps not well known or not well thought about. The first aspect is the religious aspect. You know, the, the religious practices that we do in seeking out Laylatul Qadr. Coming to the masjid, making our itikaf, perhaps praying the tasbih prayer and praying to hajjah even after taraweeh reciting the names of Allah, reciting the Qur'an. So this first aspect is this aspect, the religious aspect or the, the, the religious uh, practice or the spiritual practice or religious goal or spiritual goal. And for tonight, 
we are going to look at that in our, in our, in our comments for these few minutes. But there's also a second aspect, which ironically, I'm giving a lecture on tomorrow night in another place. And that aspect is the uh, social manifestation of Laylatul Qadr. But for now, we're focusing on the, on the spiritual or the religious aspect of Laylatul Qadr. So, again, for the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was his experience of Laylatul Qadr? At least initially, what was his experience? His experience, as we know from the report in, in Al Bukhari, the most famous, uh, the famous report in Al Bukhari, which everyone knows, his experience was in his initial experience was this introduction. His, I should say, like this: his introduction to Laylatul Qadr was in a cave, a mountain, in a cave on a mountain. A mountain which we call today, what do we call this mountain today? Jabal, Jabal and Nur. We call this mountain today the mountain of light. On this experience, on, in this cave, he saw Allah, he's there in the cave. This is his initial experience. And the angel Jibril, Gabriel, tells him, Iqara. He says, Ma'anami qarim. I'm not somebody that Iqra would know. What's he talking about? Iqra of what? You can understand that as meaning I can't read. That's the usual translation. Or you can understand that as meaning, what am I going to say? You tell me the Iqra, to say something, to recite something. What am I going to recite? And the angel tells him this three times. Iqra, Iqra, Iqra. Till finally, the words come, Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alam. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. The read or the recite in the name of your Lord who has created, created man from a clot of blood. Read, and your Lord is the most generous. الذي علم بالقلم who teaches by the use of the pen. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم who teaches man what he man didn't know previously. So these words, this constituted the Layatul, the first Layatul Qadr of Rasulullah. And what is Rasulullah? He's Al Ummi. He is someone who is not educated. He in in these first words of revelation, in his first experience of Layatul Qadr, he is made is to bring his attention to the reality of Allah, excuse me, to the realities of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the words. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq khalaq al-insana min alaq iqra wa rabbika al-akram alladhi alam al-qalam alam al-insana ma lam ya'lam Look at these words. These words tell the Prophet and these words tell those who read the Qur'an that God is not some abstract theory just out there. God is not an abstract theory. Rather, God is real. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real. And not only is Allah real, Allah is active in the world. اِقْرَى بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ is telling us that not only that Allah is not an abstract theory, but rather Allah is real and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is active in the world. And continuing on, the, the Prophet's own life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet's own life from then on is a demonstration of Allah's activity in the world. The Prophet وسلم, was receiving revelation, the Quran, which was recited before. The Prophet is receiving revelation. He memorizes it. 
he teaches it to his followers. It was also recorded on materials that were available to him, which is a, 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 a long discussion, an interesting discussion. The revelation kept coming to him all the way up to shortly before he passed away. And today, this book, this scripture is still with us. Regarding this scripture, and still going on this subject, regarding this scripture, this Quran, another beautiful set of verses. Allah says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allah says, Ar Rahman, Alam al Quran, Khalaq al Insan, Alamah al Bayan. Allah, Allah describes himself in, this, in, these, in these words, which will probably be read by the Imam of Maghrib when, uh, when we offer Maghrib. He said he describes himself as the merciful, compassionate God who teaches the Quran, who created man, and who teaches man clear expression. So in all of these verses, from the verses of Surah Yasin that was read earlier to the verses of Surah Al-Araf that, that have been, we mentioned in the beginning to the verses now from Surah Al-Rahman we find examples that we are, we are, we are being reminded of because the Qur'an is dhikr in huwa illa dhikr wa Qur'an mubin, isn't it? So we are being reminded of the activity of God in this world and we find in this a rebuttal to the idea that some philosophers hold some philosophers hold that yes god exists but god is not active in the world that perhaps god exists but he moved to another galaxy or something that you know god doesn't care we find in these verses a, a refutation of that kind of idea so knowing uh, being reminded that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an active God. And not only is he active, he's the only God. La ilaha illallah. Being, uh, being reminded that Allah is an active God. The only one deserving worship, deserving worship helps us to be guided in this life. Thus, we are reminded that indeed in the, the remembrance of Allah do the hearts find contentment. Muhammad as a man, this is what he found. Muhammad as a man, this is what he found. And this is the foundation of him from be becoming not just Muhammad the man, but he becomes Muhammad the Prophet. <laughs> so yes, the Prophet, he grieved. There are times when he grieved. There are times when he faced hardships. Even after revelation, he faced hardship. He faced enmity from the rejectors of faith. But he kept Allah. He kept the remembrance of Allah in all of his life. Thus, the books of Hadith are full of supplications, are full of athkar, of, of, uh, of, of statements of remembrance of Allah for just about every single activity. You know, there's some famous uh, books that have one book is called uh, Hisn Muslim. You know, a little famous little book, it has a, a, a dua or a zikr for just about everything. There is about everything you can find in life. And there are many other books uh, out there uh, like that. And even we don't need books, for, for the most part, the Muslims, thank God, are raised in such a way that even we don't know these books that we are taught be, be, before say, before eating to say, Bismillah. And after we eat, we say, Alhamdulillah. We don't know, we don't know, maybe the average Muslim doesn't know where it says that, but we do it. And we, we really, we learn this from Rasulullah Now, why 
does Allah ask us to worship Him? You know, sometimes we we'll ask that question. And it's actually not, it's a reasonable question. Why should we worship Allah? Some people say that, you know, that God is real. What does, he, what does He need us for? You know, that we are so insignificant. Then what do we need to worship God? What does God get from us worshiping Him? But then comes another question. That question is, well, what does worship mean? What does that term, that expression worship, what does it mean? All religious communities have worship in some form. Today is Sunday. You go to the churches, the churches, they have a worship. Different denominations may have slightly different styles, but they have a worship of God. The Jews have a worship. The way, a particular way they worship. The Hindus have different ways they worship. And every religious community has particular ways in which they worship according to certain rituals in a certain fashion. So that, that is a worship. That, that term, uh, that explanation is something that everybody, any adult human can recognize and uh, understand that meaning. But there is, and we learn this from Rasulullah himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there is a worship in living one's life in accordance to the ethical principles and practical rules based upon divine guidance. In other words, just living life, giving, living a good life is an act of worship. Just living life is a, as, a, as an act or an expression of worship of God. And not just living life, but living life in a good way. This is what we learn from the Prophet Look at the look at there's so many hadiths that prove that. The Prophet says that removing a harmful thing from the road is an act of is a demonstration of one's faith. That's the that, that is the teaching of the Prophet. He teaches the concept of lawful money, of what we call in today's language, clean money, clean money and dirty money, he teaches about that. And I actually don't know of any better teacher than him about that concept of, of, of uh, clean money and dirty money. And he teaches, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he teaches what in today's world would be called uh, public service. He teaches this. He says, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to try to move up a little faster. He says that if a person sleeps while his neighbor is hungry, he says this person is not a believer. Isn't that a powerful hadith? The person who sleeps while his neighbor is hungry, this person is not a believer. And when you look at the books of Thilq, they discuss there's another hadith which uh, describes that it, it, it defines neighbor as a person or a family, uh, 40 households to each way. That these are, this is the guess what constitutes neighbors. So in the books of Bill, they have these discussions. Like for example, you are fine, but your neighbor is starved to death. You know in, in the books of Bill, they say that the neighbors are to be fined. They're to be fined by the local government. Because they're expected to feed their neighbor. They're expected, Islam expects them to feed, the, to feed their neighbor. Now, let's go back to Laylatul Qadr and the, manifest, the religious manifestations of Laylatul Qadr. The religious manifestations of Laylatul Qadr can be viewed as the core of the rituals of Ramadan. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took it seriously. It is said that the companions of the Prophet would prepare for Ramadan six months in advance. It is said that it is said that they would that the Sahaba will prepare six months in advance for Ramadan. And in the last ten days, excuse me, I keep saying days. In the last ten nights of Ramadan. The Prophet ﷺ would engage in seclusion. It's called the Artikaf. 
he would engage in seclusion into the mosques and in the mosque and he would dedicate himself to worship and zikr and prayer and and you know, without the distractions of this world without worldly distractions and perhaps in today's world you know a, a part of engaging in the right to would be to, to disable your your internet usage on your phone <laughs> and then turn off the television. So Ramadan is a good opportunity to make resolutions, even if we are not doing itikaf. <coughs> so thus, turning off the television, it can be hard. Turning off the computer or turning off your internet, it, that, that can be hard. But more, but more than that, making resolutions to improve your mood, to improve your spirituality, to improve your level of happiness. Now let's face it, change is difficult. Even if the change is something that's needed, the, the, the act of changing is, is very difficult. Even small changes is difficult. This is why we should have great respect for this person who converts to Islam. I hate this word convert, by the way. But we should have respect, but I'm using the word even though I hate the word, but we should have respect for the person who decides to accept Islam when he or she was previously a follower of another religion or a follower of no religion. Because it's, it takes courage to change. That's a significant change so from, from being a, a, an atheist to a Muslim or a Jew to a Muslim or a Christian to a Muslim. This is an act of courage. Particularly when Islam is a minority religion. We are not even 1% 2% of the American population. So it's an act of courage for someone to accept Islam. So Ramadan in general, and Laylatul Qadr in particular, these are wonderful moments to reflect and to tell ourselves, yes, we can improve. Yes, we can become better. Yes, we can grow. And yes, we can become people who think properly. About Layyatul Qadr, we're almost finished, God willing. About Layyatul Qadr. It is said by the Mufassirun, by the commentators of the Quran and the uh, theologians, uh, scholars of, of Islam. It is said that Laylatul Qadr is the moment, a time in which, in essence, destinies are assigned for the year to come. And this moment is also said, though this is a, a controversial issue, but this moment is also said to be the 15th of Sha'ban, the month that preceded this month. Thus, in some parts of the world, you know, on the 15th of Sha'ban, people are engaged in much more liquor and invocation. Now, about that, the traditions that the practices and beliefs about the 15th Sha'ban, those traditions, the, 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 the practices or the beliefs that are based upon those traditions are very much in dispute as to their strength. And there are some verses in Surah the Dukhan which are cited in connection to those uh, traditions and particular beliefs, and beliefs. However, and I'm just sort of skipping ahead, those verses in context seem to point to the Quran itself being that which contains all we need in terms of judging right and wrong, and judging ethics and judging ahkam. Now, with all of that said, now comes another important uh, a couple of questions. What is destiny? Do we as human beings truly have free will? If you know, everything is destined for you, what's, what's the free will? Do we have free will? What, is, what does this all mean? And these are questions, they're very fascinating questions, which people who follow other religions, uh, uh, excuse me, to the followers of, of other religions, uh, maybe within Islam, outside of Islam, these are things that have been People have been grappling with questions that they've been people have been grappling with for thousands of years. So we have to look at these questions honestly because sometimes these questions are associated with Layl al Qadr, 
which I hope I have shown, that they are associated with the Qadr. And or at the very least, they are associated with the concept of Qadr uh, itself, which is the word used typically for the word destiny. Let's try to make something um, more practical. In the articles of faith that uh, we are taught, we recite this. It says, وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنْ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنْ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى That Qadr, the, the good of it and the bad of it, both come from Allah, the Almighty. وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنْ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى So what is Qadr? And that's a long question, a long uh, ish subject. But what is Qadr? Qadr can be understood as simply referring to the limitations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set forth. Limitations is not the same thing as what people, uh, we, the way we think of when we say the word destiny or predestiny. Limitation is not necessarily the same thing. So yes, we have a free will, but that free will is of a limited nature. I have in this hand, I have a pen. I have a pen in this hand. I can write with this pen. I can write good things with it. I can put it to a positive use. I can write bad things with it. I can harm somebody. I can stab somebody with this pen, create great harm for them. But I can't, and I can throw this pen. However, I can only throw this so far because the, the law of gravity is going to make it drop. This is Qadr. This is an, under, this is an easy explanation of, uh, of Qadr. I can't use this to change the television channel on my, on, on my television. So, what does all this mean for our, our subject? It means that seeking out Laylatul Qadr for ourselves is within our ability. And the very act of seeking out Laylatul Qadr teaches us that we can create a better future for our life. We can, I want to emphasize this, we can, for example, discard all of the thinking and actions or even discard the people who are toxic to our lives and who are toxic to our Iman. We can discard them. And by the word discard, I mean take them out of our immediate company that brings us harm. So we can have true friends and not fake friends. We can work on ourselves. The Layl al Qadr teaches us to work on ourselves in the areas that require emotional maturity. Try to work on issues of the, that we may have. Do, do we have issues of greed? Do we have issues of, uh, of jealousy? Do we have issues of envy? If, you, if we are in um, you know, fi financial uh, hardships, we can learn or we can seek out the solution, you know, to make, make resolutions, you know, try to figure out how we can solve the, these problems. We can be a part of a healthy jama'a, of healthy community. A community, not just any community, but a community that is rooted in the Book of Allah, and a community that is rooted in the Sunnah of the Prophet, the final Prophet, the So, so resolutions. So if we have any bad habits, like the habit of drinking and the habit of smoking, then we can resolve, we can make resolutions to cut those things from our lives. So it may be necessary to take small steps a bit at a time, but let us take small steps. There is a, a very beautiful du'a of the Prophet Sallallahu which is connected to Laylatul Qadr. And I hope that uh, we, we will make this uh, du'a. 
And the dua is, I will say, I'll say it in Arabic and then give the translation. Allahumma innaka thu'un thibu'af fa'afu anna or fa'afu anni. It says, O oh Allah, indeed you are the forgiver. You love to forgive. So do forgive me, fa'afu anni. Or fa'afu anna, do forgive us. Now the word af, I use the word forgive. But there's actually a, a de- it's actually a deeper meaning than the, the word forgive. Because the word af, it means to erase. It means to blot out. In other words, we are learning this from Rasulullah. What are we learning? We are learning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to grant second, third chances. He loves to grant new life to people who want new life. He grants again and again and again and again and again. So, if we are worshiping in the in these last ten nights of Ramadan, particularly twenty seventh of Ramadan, uh, expecting a, a feeling of euphoria, uh, wanting to have the same experience that the Prophet sallallahu had in the cave, or having the same experience that Prophet Musa alayhi had. In, on the, uh, in the burning bush, at the burning bush. If we are looking for that experience and if that experience doesn't happen, well, don't feel bad. It might happen, it may not happen. And it's also possible, according to some scholars, that Laylatul Qadr can be felt outside of Ramadan. But it is also possible that Laylatul Qadr will be felt in a way that we don't expect. So let us worship, not necessarily for brownie points, but let us worship because we love Allah. Let us worship because it brings us closer to Allah. Let us worship because ultimately that worship will bring us benefit, not just in this, not just in the hereafter, but in the here and now. And Allah says, when my servants ask about you, about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah says, when my service asks you about me, then I am close. The very act of, think of, of saying Allah, asking for Allah is enough to generate His presence. I listen. I listen to the call of those who called me. So let those who call, let them believe in me. Let, um, let them believe in me so that perhaps they shall grow up. And Allah says about prayer, These are the benefits of worship. They are not for Allah. He doesn't need them, but we need them. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He accept our prayer, that our fasting, any good actions that we do. We pray that that this night and any other all of the nights are all that this becomes a chance for us to have new life. Wa khadawana and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran Thank you so much, Imam Shamsuddin. He's traveled from Ohio.